Every C-level executive plus the corresponding business operations lead is in that meeting and we review every metric in the organization. So sales, customer success, we review pipeline, we review every item and across every metric that you can think about. I mean, you could call it, you could run, but you can't hide meeting as well, right? I mean, obviously it's, it's I'm sure, it, obviously everyone's got the most positive intentions, but it's all out in the open. There's no gaming the system, you know, the data's there. This is Revenue Makers, the podcast by Six Sense, investigating successful revenue strategies that pushed companies ahead. Saima, it's that time again. You feeling it? Always. Are you kidding me? Who are we jamming with today? Our guest today is Robert Zimmerman, and he's the chief revenue officer at Qualified and a sales leader with an absolute baller. And I say baller, which maybe I shouldn't be saying <laughs> at my age, but absolute baller background. Salesforce, Oracle, to name a few, really impressive background. No big deal, right? No, not at all. So today's topic, it makes my heart flutter. We're going to be diving into the data-driven decision-making for revenue teams. Robert is one of the most data-driven CROs I've ever met. And so maybe we just call this episode the iHeart Data episode. <laughs> this is going to be an all-out data geek fest of the best kind. And I bet, I'm pretty sure by the end, we're going to have some really great actionable insights for our audience. So... You ready? Let's do it. Robert, we're so excited to have you on the podcast today. For our listeners, Robert is the Chief Revenue Officer of Qualified. Robert, do you want to add to that intro? Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Saima. I'm very excited for this conversation. I've been at Qualified for about two and a half years. We are a company that has been partnered with Sixth Sense for quite a while, and we're very excited to have this conversation about how data impacts the organization. Now, prior to, to Qualified, I spent a couple of years at Twilio, building out their go-to-market efforts within the Americas, and then was 18 years at Salesforce before I made the move. So have been around the industry for a while, can say that everything that we're going through did experience it a couple of times earlier, which is very interesting. There's a lot of the people who we work with, I think seeing this for the first time in terms of what's happening out there in the market. Very cool. So data, I think when you think of the go-to-market motion, there's lots of discussions around how difficult it is to talk, to measure marketing, or even on the CS side, what should we be measuring? Sales generally, if we're going to generalize, I guess, there's specific metrics that are tracked. There's a pretty well-defined view of the world of what good looks like and what bad looks like. I think, though, the cadence with which, number one, it is leveraged consistently across the board as we speak to other companies, we recognize that basic things like scorecards and whatnot, not everyone's using it. So as a very data-driven CRO, my first question for you is, how do you define the transformative role of data in helping you understand your organization's performance? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's actually very timely because... We're currently planning and putting together our FY25 strategy for board approval coming up shortly. And so the way I'm thinking about things, obviously, is we're thinking about what is our strategy for next year? How will it be different if it will be different from what we're doing in this year? We run the Salesforce fiscal year. So when we talk about FY25, it's because we end our fiscal year at the end of January. And so I look at my go-to-market team and we start by anchoring on what we consider our ICP and think about our market sizing. Music to my ears, but keep going. Hey, ICP, she did a heart boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting. You look at it this way. Our role is to determine where opportunity exists and really identify high propensity to buy accounts to pursue. And so everything that we do, we start with, okay, let's think about territory carving. How do we balance up our territories based on intent? And really, you're trying to optimize a fast start and timely engagement at the beginning of a fiscal year. When we think about that, if I take that a step further, how do we operationalize that data and provide dashboards and notifications to help our sellers to really focus on the right prioritization of their efforts? And so we talk about, can you put together a cup of coffee dashboard, meaning that we provide our sellers these dashboards that 
if something appears on it, they should drop their cup of coffee and immediately engage. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's really good. And what sorts of things are on the coffee dashboard? I'm like completely going yeah. off script now because you've got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about the space that we operate in today, we live in a world where new projects are harder to come by. It's not that they don't exist, but we live in a period where everybody's talking about sales efficiency. Everybody's talking about consolidation of their efforts. And we're fortunate in that we have a competitor who's on their heels for a variety of different reasons, which we don't necessarily have to go into today. But the way I think about this, it's lift and shift of existing spend over to us. And so we're utilizing ABM strategies. We're utilizing six cents today for intent. We're engaging using uh, sales engagement tools internally. And then we have something at Qualified that we're really proud of. We call it our one-two punch, where we try to drive activity to our website where we can engage directly with our customers. And so what we're really thinking about is how do we operationalize and how do we take a strategy and actually when the rubber meets the road, what is it that the team and the sellers that actually are responsible for their quota, what can they focus on and what should they be doing? Very cool. So, so as you're going into the, pl we're in the planning now, and I'm sure this changes, and I'm sure it's changed in the last day or two or last month or two or whatever, because obviously we're in this world of a bunch of unknowns and so forth. But do you have a core set of KPIs that you're walking into your planning sessions with that are, Irrefutable. These are the ones we're going to work on. And then how has that evolved over, like I said, over the last short term, again, in terms of like the macroeconomic period that we're dealing with? When we think about KPIs and there's some very key KPIs that if you're in the SaaS business, so you're tracking, you know, you're looking at ACV, you're looking at ARR, you're looking at your NRR, your GRR. And I'm assuming in this audience, we're all going to know what that means. We also take a really close look at what's happening within our ASPs. We're looking at the health of the multi-year of our business. So are we creating longer term agreements, giving us deferred revenue over time? We're tracking new business versus expansion. I work at a company that we're really new business oriented. We're probably 80, 85% is net new business to us as a company. And when we think about health of the business, things like what does create and close look like for the quarter? What should we expect? What has it been historically and what should we align on? And by create and close, the way we think about it is anything that's created within the quarter and that gets to be closed within the quarter. A very good metric to determine the health of a business. I'm a big believer that comp plans have to be aligned with these KPIs. It's one thing to say, okay, we're going to measure everybody on these KPIs. It's another thing if you're not paying your reps on that same thing. A good example for our team today is we actually have multi-year out of the money, meaning it's in addition to your OTE. And so what that's allowed us to do is, although it's been a little more of a challenging environment, we have account executives when they're trying to close business, a much more incentive to close multi-year business because it's additional money that they can put into their pocket. We look at competitive scorecards. Once again, obviously, we've got a couple of very key competitors that we're looking to lift and shift their dollars and move them over, over to qualified. And so we really focus on those key performance indicators from a revenue standpoint. Obviously, things like close rates and conversion rates within different stages of our pipeline cycle become really important as well. But we try to keep it simple and we try to make sure it's aligned with what we're paying our reps on. Yeah, love it. Everything that you just said is such a great takeaway. Last question on planning. So obviously you're setting the plan for the year right now. How often are you taking a look at that plan? Is it a quarterly sort of recast of do the assumptions still hold? Are we still on track? I guess it is a living, breathing sort of thing as much as we'd love to be as predictable as possible. Yeah, I think we live in a day where we're reviewing this quarterly. So I believe that we most likely will see a few more quarters of this until we get back to a little more of a normalized growth trajectory that, you know, it's been very challenging for all companies. We've been very fortunate in that 
I think the revisions that we've made on a quarterly basis are not really materially different, but we are trying to make sure that we're as accurate as possible and communicating as accurately as possible to our execs and also to our board. I think the one thing that I'm a big proponent of is deliver bad news early. So for example, we may be off on a metric and rather than wait until the end of a quarter, we're going to communicate those things as soon as we find out, we're going to figure out sort of a plan to get back to health in those areas. And we've always felt that that is a key way for us to actually drive the business. But we're going to be in a challenging time for a few more quarters. And I think we're in a, in a place where you have to review your plans on a quarterly basis. Makes sense. You know, so thinking about planning, moving on from that, you know, the culture of data, so incredibly important, right? In terms of you come into an organization and I think you're about two and a half years in it qualified, right? So you Correct. joined, there was leadership team in place to some extent already and all that. Was your experience that you came into, it doesn't necessarily have to be at this role, could be other roles as well, where the culture of data was something that you you brought with you, that was something that was there. And if you went in some place and it was like, we're doing our planning, you know, based on the where the sun rises and if it's raining or not, getting to that culture of data where everyone's just reading from the same page, obviously, but accepting data as the truth, as opposed to like, I don't know how many times I've sat in meetings in various roles where it's like, well, I think, and I feel, and it's like, it's not an emotional exercise, it's <laughs> data. So like, how do you address that? Which I'm sure it's varies so much from place to place. Yeah, no, it's, it, that's actually a, a great question. And it's a fascinating situation. I think the most important thing is you've got to speak the same language. So you've got to define your revenue operations the same way so that when you talk about ARR, for example, you're talking about the same thing. When you talk about ACB, you're talking about the same thing. So my history has always been a very, very strong direct selling like motion. And coming out of Oracle and especially at Salesforce, which is highly operational, it's monthly oriented, it drives a cadence that's really important where you use data to, to make informed decisions. When I left Salesforce and I joined Twilio, I went out of a direct selling organization into a much more, I would say, product-led growth with sales-assisted overlay on top of that, where we were looking at API usage, we were looking at engagement based on reams and reams of data. For example, what is the first time somebody pings an API to test out a new use case that somebody has and what is the engagement strategy and what do we look like? If you talk, think about the orchestration around that for a sales organization. And so when I come into any organization, I'm now back into a very sales-led company. The way I think about things is we have to speak the same language, but then you have to make a decision. Do you continue down the status quo, which in our world is never going to be a strategy? You always have to look at what is it that you want to do. And that basically means, do you think about going up? If you're an SMB-focused company, do you go up into the enterprise? If you're an enterprise-focused company, do you go down into SMB and look at more sort of a product-led type of situation? Do you go wide? Do you look at adjacencies and other industries and verticals where you could extend your product portfolio. We talk about, do you go far? Like for example, we are predominantly the Americas based, although we've got a number of probably about 15, 20% of our customer base is external to the Americas and in Europe and Asia pack, but we don't have necessarily people there. And then the last thing is, do you go deep? Meaning do you get really in a verticalization within a business and get into that vein? And it's very difficult to make any one of those decisions without really good data to inform whether or not that's the next best step for you. Love it. I've got a two-parter for you. Everything you just said about the data informing the decisions, I think some of this is around consistency of the metrics, a single source of truth. So I guess the first part of the question is who owns the data for you and your org and, and all the reports and dashboards? And then secondly, how do you leverage that data? Do you have forums or regular cadence or an operating rhythm where you as a leadership team are sitting and reviewing the data and kind of what does that look like? Yeah. So to answer your first question, we have a strong revenue operations function within my team. I've got a great leader, Karen Snaith, who actually owns our SDR, BDR teams, owns technology, business applications, 
owns reporting and operationalization of everything that we do that's data related. And he has a team that's focused on sales. We've got somebody focused on customer success and somebody focused on marketing. So we really drive that. But a way to think about how we put this into action is I have an operational cadence that I adhere to every week and it doesn't change. And so we anchor around an exec dashboard review, which is a 90 minute review that happens every Tuesday. And every C-level executive plus the corresponding business operations lead is in that meeting. And we review every metric in the organization. So sales, customer success, we review pipeline, we review every item and across every metric that you can think about. And so we all anchor around that as being sort of the most important thing that happens in that week. Now, the morning of that Tuesday, I sit down with my individual sales leaders and I have individual manager forecast calls for 50 minutes across each sales leader in preparation for that. And then every Friday, we have a customer success call, which is leader driven. That happens every Friday morning. And then I have a forecast call, which is all team. And the way we do this is the manager comes in and speaks to their commit, their best case, how they're going to get there. And then we review five transactions in every team. And it's basically a rapid shot where every person who's on there will speak for about 30 seconds, just covering the most important relevant points on their transaction. But it allows everybody to have a voice. And so if I think about that cadence, that doesn't change. It happens every week. Everybody's accustomed to that. And it's really important from my view is you've got to have that operational cadence. If you try to reschedule things, if you try to, you know, we had a, a holiday just recently and we actually moved our Friday call to Thursday. It's that important that we do it every week because it keeps people motivated and informed as to what's going on in the business. The other thing I do, and this comes back to sort of good news, bad news. I provide a monthly summary that goes out to our exec team 11 p.m. on the last day of every month. And it comes out like clockwork and we cover off every metric. So we don't wait until the exec meeting. We're covering off every metric and we talk about areas that we feel really good about and areas that we missed and what happened. And so I think that operational cadence is really important as you think about running a business. Amazing. The data is literally woven into the fabric of every part of your org. And I think the consistency is probably why you're so successful because so much of this can be shiny object syndrome and we've got a new dashboard and look at what we have here, but yeah. the consistency of the metrics, the consistency of the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And just, I think the importance that that lends to something like this, the fact that there is exec priorities assigned to this, right? You mentioned every single C-level person is in that Tuesday meeting. I mean, kudos to you. That That's pretty exceptional. I mean, you could call it, you could run, but you can't hide meeting as well, right? I mean, obviously it's, it's I'm sure, it, obviously everyone's got the most positive intentions, but it's all out in the open. There's no gaming the system. There's yeah. no trying to, you know, the data's there. That's something. When you think about like all the things that you were just talking through and other organizations that are attempting to be more data-driven to drive, to, to make those decisions, it's pretty overwhelming. It just, there's so many ways you can do it and so forth. And if if you were talking to somebody who was maybe just getting started, looking at an organization, look, I really want to bring this operational vigor, want to bring this data decision not making, where do you start? And how do you sort of ease your way into it? Because obviously you can't just snap your fingers overnight, yeah, have yeah. all of this. It's certainly going to be a crawl, walk, run scenario. Where do you start? I think you have to bifurcate the intent. And what I mean by that is, you have the goal that you would like to have as an end result. And so let's say that cadence or whatever it is, the things that you'd like to track, you've got to orchestrate that. But at the same time, you have to remember that most salespeople and most sellers are conditioned to eliminate noise and focus on just what matters to them. I mean, they're really, really good at doing that. And some people say that Sellers are coin operated. They've got a number of different attributes of like the common meme of like the seller with ADD and they kind of like keep their attention on something. And there is some truth to that, but also think about this. We're a small company. We have in sales alone, 25 business applications. 
and I'm not counting what exists within marketing. I'm not counting what exists. This is what exists on my PL. And I look at my operational expense and I, we've got 25 apps. And you think, okay, well, what could they be? But you just add them up. And so when I think about the tactics and the strategy and think about that bifurcation of the two, you have to create a catch-all so you can see what's happening in the business as an executive. But for your sellers, you have to drive focus because if you make everything important, nothing's going to be important to them. And so what we try to do is while we look, and I'll give an example, while we look at a number of different metrics on that exec review, that dashboard review we have every Tuesday, what I talk to the team about is specific campaigns or specific initiatives that we have in the field. And a really good example of one right now that we have going on is really around a consolidation strategy where we're looking at two independent vendors. We're identifying companies that use those two. We're enabling the field to pursue them. And now we're going through a campaign of consolidation strategy where we can take those two vendors, have a more efficient, better consolidated story and provide the orchestration of what those accounts look like to their sales team so they don't necessarily have to go look for them. And I think this is really a way that if I were entering an organization, pick and choose some battles in the field, but put the infrastructure and start laying the foundation to really run a tight operational ship across your all the different metrics that you track. Yeah, I love it. And I, I think just in today's environment, we touched on this, right? There's uncertainty. One of our episodes is around literally B2B inflation and just how much more it takes to win a deal. I think the one thing we can control is execution and making sure that we are running a tight ship. So I appreciate all of that context. We talked about broad metrics. I'd love to just get a little bit of insight into rep-specific metrics that you track. You mentioned scorecards. Are they at the rep level? You mentioned you'd rather identify early, frankly, if something is not working well. So how do you do that in terms of performance managing your team? If I think about a rep level, the things that are important to me are productivity metrics. And the easy way to think about this is everybody contributing. And the way I look at this is what is the speed to the first transaction a seller has and then how do you maintain their contribution levels? And the second is attainment. How are they doing against their quota? And how are we as an organization doing with average attainment across the total capacity we have in the business? Now, within that, I'm looking at a number of different things, and I'll sort of rattle some of these off. Obviously, we're very much hunter-driven. So we look at the, the number of new customer logos that we win. Within those, we are looking at what is the average selling price. So obviously, you don't want to be seeing an average selling price go down over time because the quality of the transactions might be at risk. We look at average deal length. So how effective are we in moving a transaction through the cycle? We look at expansion versus new business as well. So are we actually seeding and growing future selling opportunities for us? And then from a create and close standpoint, how are we actually pursuing high intent opportunities? And like, this is where I think the relationship between qualified and sixth sense really comes in is if I start thinking about the most important things during purchase or decision stage, if we're highlighting those things, we want those things to exist within Salesforce so that we're actually having some outbounding effort that goes on where we see that high intent. And for us at Qualified, because we're all about pipeline creation and converting on your website, the most important thing is we want to drive that intent or that activity back to the Qualified website so that we can then engage with them and actually show them, we call it you know, basic Qualified and Qualified, so that when they experience what we do with them, that they come back and they say, I want some of that because it is that good, that experience is that good. And so we're really focused. And these things, we review them on a monthly basis with the sales team. So we look at some of these metrics. We're transparent about what we track. It's important that reps understand how they get measured because there's nothing worse than a seller basically saying, I didn't realize that was an important metric that I need to be focused on. So the more that you can share with them and limit it to a certain number of things that are sort of controllable, the better the outcomes are going to be. Thanks, Sarah. So 
can you give an example of you're looking at a data set, it's either a planning session, it's one of your weekly cadences, and just something has shown up in the data that it's so, I don't know, a light bulb goes on or just like, wow, what a trend, something that we just hadn't seen until now that ultimately may help you make a new decision or pivot just based purely on the fact that you had the data in front of you. Like, I'm sure you've got a bunch of them, but one that sort of stands out as like, this was pivotal wouldn't have done it without this analysis and it, it had a major impact on the business. Actually, you got a great example because we were talking about that just the other day. Because we're so new business focused, we're very, very heavy outbound focused. And so I would say 80 to 85% of what we end up closing is actually outbound generated. Wow. And so that investment actually then creates what I would say is a lot of noise and a lot of junk. And what we were finding was the focus on creating what we call S1 pipeline, the first like stage one pipeline, resulted in a real significant drop in our close rates. And so we basically came to the conclusion that what we were doing was we we're doing ourselves a disservice because we were just trying to fill up that S1 pipeline and going back to you get what you pay for. It was in their reps plans to create S1 pipeline. We actually found that the data suggested that if we held the team to higher conversion rates from S1 to S2. And so, for example, in this case, we wanted 60% conversion rates from S1 to S2. And S2 is a sales qualified and accepted lead. Yeah. yeah. We realized that we needed to track the different types of pipeline we were creating, set the campaigns around that. But the most important thing is we want to make sure we started paying on S2. And then lo and behold, you figure out, okay, we're no longer getting these sort of weird, arbitrary sales leads coming our way where these first calls are really, they just want to get the DoorDash credit that we're going to give them or they want to get like, our, our team is pretty good in terms of our outbounding, but let's just say at the end of the day, they just want to show up to get whatever the reward was to instead to let's show up because we're a good fit. We use intent. We orchestrate what we're trying to get out of this. And it changed everything because we started looking at pipeline types and not every pipeline type closes at the same rate. And so we started bucketing different pipelines and then we're now incenting our sellers, our sort of BDRs and SDRs to focus on the highest probability pipeline type that drives the best conversion rates. And so we're still at the very beginning of this. We just made this change from last quarter, um, from Q2 into Q3. So we've had one quarter under our belt with this, but it's, it's made a significant difference in terms of our outcome. Yeah, I love that. We actually went through a similar exercise, Robert, where we recognized that what we were incenting and paying people on was not necessarily the behavior that we wanted. And it's amazing how the behavior changes when you change oh, the comp. 100%. We also, we changed the comp and we also did something in Salesforce that was pretty interesting. We created a separate opportunity record type that we called a pre-op. And that pre-op allowed you to not inflate the true pipeline, but we had SLAs in there. So it was either went from pre-op stage one to dead or pre-op stage one to multi-threading, meaning that you got to the right person, but they were below the line or we need more time or you got to get to somebody else. And then coming out of that, we then converted into an opportunity that was sales accepted. And so it actually cleaned up a lot of what we were doing within Salesforce, which I really liked. Yeah, that pre-op, I mean, it actually has a similar model, a company I was at previously. And like that gives you a, like a lot more granular conversion data too, and kind of understanding like what the BDRs are doing. It's actually, I was a Sixth Sense customer, we were implementing it. And I think we found it in a book somewhere. There was some random book that actually, made. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And it, it went through and like, it just suddenly solved so many problems. So it's, it's, it's fun to hear about that one again, that it's, it's out there. So there's so many takeaways from this call. I feel like there should be a case study written about all the little nuggets we pulled out from here. But we like to ask one question of every guest. And I feel like we all had an experience where we were asked in our jobs to do something completely ridiculous. Ridiculous good or ridiculous bad, by the way. Can you give us an example of the most ridiculous thing you've been asked to do and whether it actually worked or not? It's not really tied to driving business outcomes or anything, but we did do a leukemia fundraiser and the, the idea was you get to pie your favorite executive. And <laughs> we ended up raising the most money. This was at Salesforce. But the reason I bring this up, I had an executive work for me 
And she took it upon herself to really give me a wallop. And I ended up on my <laughs> butt, like sliding on all this pie stuff on the ground. And I did it for charity. So <laughs> that's there the weirdest sort of thing I got engaged with. So pies in your operational cadence, is that your advice as well? Exactly. Kind of going forward to, yeah. well, that's great advice, obviously. <laughs> but I, well, great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. I think we've got, to Simon's point, so much that the audience can take. And we have our own notes, of course, as well. So again, thanks so much for joining us and appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam and Simon. I really appreciate the opportunity. You've been listening to Revenue Makers. Do you have a revenue project you were asked to execute that had wild success? Share your story with us at sixcents.com slash revenue. And we might just ask you to come on the show. And if you don't want to miss the next episode, be sure to follow along on your favorite podcast app.